God is the Spirit. And those who worship Him do so in spirit and truth. We come to this place, we honor authenticity. Every day, broken, sorrowful, jubilant, joyful, come to honor and praise the Most High. The spirit that lives in this moment and all the moments to come, the spirit that dwells within each and every one of us, that compels us to live in the image of Jesus and pursue living water at every turn. And I hope that as you enter this place, you are thirsty, a thirst that can only be quenched by God. I hope that you come longing for the presence to be within you and around you. And I hope you come open so that you may be filled. Would you pray with me? Sustainer God, we thank you for the way that you move in our lives, for the way that you challenge us, for the way that you push us, for the way that you help us to evolve and grow. God, may we recognize that you are the spirit and the truth, and your kingdom has no barriers. Your kingdom doesn't look the way that we want it to or the way that we think it should. It's not limited to our perspective. God, may we lean into your understanding of the world. May we listen to your call and be led wherever you shall lead us. May you be in the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart that we might all hear that call, that we might all be a part of the change that's happening in the world, that we might be your agents of peace, and the children of God proclaim together. Amen. During this Lenten journey, we've committed ourselves to, to stripping away all of those barriers that we've had. These barriers that come between us and God. To let ourselves really be vulnerable. To let ourselves stand naked before God that, that allows us to truly encounter the living spirit that dwells among us. And we've dedicated ourselves to, to truly examining those relationships that we have in our lives. Not just understanding them at a surface level, but really digging into them. To examine our hearts and hear the way that God is teaching us and the way that God is calling us to live. To really finally address the trauma and the insecurity that, that's created these wounds for all these years. Start the process to, to heal the wounds that have been left untouched. And this season, it's about surrender. Surrendering to the way that God is calling us to live. Surrendering to the will of God in this world. It's about committing to growth and to evolution so that we might be part of the change that's happening in the world. So that we might know renewal and restoration and the hope that God is imparting in our lives. And at the end of it all, the end of it all, when we've carved out a space for God to dwell in our lives, we can truly encounter the presence, the spirit among us. We can reconcile with it all over again. And in the season of Lent, I always think of two things, right? I always think of the wilderness, right? And I think of water. Now, you understand the wilderness piece, right? Because I've already preached that sermon. You've heard it, right? You're done with it, right? But it makes sense, right? That first week of Lent, we, we, we tackled Jesus' trek through the wilderness, how he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights to prepare himself to be tempted by the devil. The wilderness makes sense. But water, it's peculiar, right? I mean, obviously, we, we start this Lenten journey on the heels of Jesus' baptism. Water is interesting in so many ways. It, it intrigues my spirit. I guess the largest piece of water is the restoration piece. When Jesus was baptized, he was reborn again. He was restored and finally acknowledged in the eyes of God, this is my beloved, for who I am well pleased. Right? We hope to have the same experiences during the season of Lent, that we might be restored and reconciled and reborn in this image of God. There's something about water that just draws us all in, right? It leaves us in awe, but it's still slightly perplexing. We always embrace the mystery of all of it, right? 
especially when I think about the water in these kind of cloudy and dirty bodies of water, right? You just don't know what lurks beneath the surface. I had a cousin of mine that went swimming in the lake, and he used to say, I'm not swimming in that dirty water. I don't know what's under there. Anybody not like swimming in dirty water? Yeah. Just don't know what's under there. And then the ocean's even worse, right? Because it's just so very deep and you just don't know. You think of Jaws and you think of all of these movies, right? What's lurking beneath the surface? I just don't know. And it's funny, right? But it's true. It's so very true. We don't know what's under there. Experts, I'm talking experts at the sea, say that over 80% of the ocean is unexplored, unmapped, and has never, ever been seen by human eyes. Over 80%. Put it into perspective, we've mapped more of the moon than our own oceans. To put it even more in perspective, we've mapped and seen more of Mars than our own oceans. It's kind of wild, right? 80 plus percent. We just don't know. But our spirits are kind of like that, aren't they? You really don't know what's lurking beneath the surface. Even if you've been through years and years of therapy and you think you know, you really just don't know. Just barely scratching the surface there. And as much as we like to think that we know everything, we don't. And that not knowing, the unknown of all of it, well, if we're honest, it scares us. It scares us to our core. In the same way the depths of the water scare us. The mystery of all of it, the terror of encountering, that's something that we really don't want to see, right? It's the reason many of us have avoided therapy over all the years. I just don't want to do it. I don't know what's going to happen in there. The same reason why my cousin didn't want to step foot in that dirty water. I just don't know. Our scripture today is a great one. It's a great one. It encourages us to die. And that's what this season is all about. We've first committed that we're going to strip, right? And then we begin this process of examining. And the only next logical step is to dive head first then. And John writes here in this passage, to get there, he had to pass through Samaria. He came through Sakar, Samaritan village that bordered on the field Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. And Jacob's well was still there. Jesus, worn out by the trip, he sat down the well. It was noon. A woman, a Samaritan, came close to draw water. And Jesus said, would you give me a drink of water? His disciples had gone to the village to buy food for lunch. And the Samaritan woman was taken aback. And she said, how come you, a Jew, are asking me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? Jews in those days wouldn't be caught dead talking to Samaritans. And Jesus answered, if you knew the generosity of God, and who I am, you would be asking me for a drink, and I would give you fresh, living water. <clears throat> and the woman said, sir, you don't even have a bucket to draw with, and this well is deep. So how are you going to get this living water? Are you a better man than our ancestor Jacob, who dug this well and drank from it? He and his sons and livestock and passed it down to us. And Jesus said, everyone who drinks this water will get thirsty again and again. And anyone who drinks the water I give will never thirst. Not ever. The water I give will be an arti artisan spring within, gushing fountains of endless life. And the woman said, sir, give me this water. So I won't ever get thirsty. Won't ever come back to this well again. And he said, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband. That's nicely put, I have no husband. You've had five husbands. And the man you're lying with now isn't even your husband. You spoke the truth there, sure enough. Oh, so you're a prophet. Well, tell me this. Our ancestors worship God at this mountain, but you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place for worship, right? Believe me, woman, the time is coming when you Samaritans will worship the Father neither here at this mountain nor there in Jerusalem. You worship guessing in the dark. We Jews worship in the clear light of day. 
God's way of salvation is made available through the Jews. But the time is coming. It has, in fact, come. When what you're called will not matter. And where you go to worship, well, it won't matter. It's who you are and the way you live that counts before God. Your worship must engage your spirit in the pursuit of truth. That's the kind of people that God is looking for. Those who are simply and honestly themselves before God in their worship. God is sheer being itself, spirit. Those who worship him must do it out of their very being, their spirit, their true selves in adoration. And the woman said, I don't know about that. I do know the Messiah is coming. And when he arrives, we'll get the whole story. I am he, said Jesus. You don't have to wait any longer or look any further. And just at that moment, the disciples came back and they were shocked. They couldn't believe he was talking with that kind of woman. No one said what they were all thinking, but their faces. Their faces showed it. And the woman took the hint and left. And in her confusion, she left her water pot. And back in the village, she told the people, come and see a man who knew all the things I did. Who knows me inside and out. Do you think this could be the Messiah? And they went out to see for themselves. And in the meantime, the disciples pressed him, Rabbi, eat. Aren't you going to eat? He told them, I've got food to eat you know nothing about. Jesus was so frustrated to talk to you sometimes. Got food you know nothing about. Huh? And the disciples were puzzled. Who could have brought him food? And Jesus said, the food that keeps me going is that I do the will of the one who sent me, finishing the work he started. As you look around right now, what did you say? That in about four months, it'll be time for harvest. Well, I'm telling you to open your eyes and to take a good look at what's right in front of you. These Samaritan fields are right. It's harvest time. The harvester isn't waiting. He's taking his pay, gathering in this grain that's right for eternal life. Now the sower is arm in arm with the harvester triumphant. It's the truth of the saying, the one who sows, that one harvests. I sent you to harvest the field you never worked. Without lifting a finger, you have walked in on a field worked long and hard by others. And many of the Samaritans from that village, they committed themselves to him because of that woman's witness. He knew all about the things I did. He knows me inside and out. And they asked him to stay on. So Jesus stayed two days. A lot more people entrusted their lives to him when they heard what he had to say. And they said to the woman, we're no longer just taking this on your say-so. We heard it ourselves, and we know it for sure. He's the Savior of the world. We hear this story, and we think about the power of Jesus, right? That he could convince these people to believe in him. How he was able to evangelize in such a strong way. And convert this whole village. This whole village to follow in the way of God. And that's true. It's very true. That's one way to interpret it. But the real strength of this passage comes not from Jesus, but it comes from the strength of the Samaritan woman. The truth is that most of us, we don't have the spiritual, the emotional, or the mental fortitude that's necessary in order to make a transition in the way that she does. As Jesus is speaking to her, she begins to see. In a true way, she begins to see who he is. And at that site, she is being given the gift that leads to real worship and to becoming a conduit for living water in the world. Now, I know what you're thinking. You've got this internal voice that made me say, I'm strong enough to make a transition. And you may be right. You may be right. But the truth of the matter is, if God was standing right here, right now, and told you to turn your back on everything you know, on the way that you practice your faith, on the way that you worship, on the way that you do things, would you turn? Would you throw it all away and say, I'm going to go this way? Everything you know about what it means to worship God, where to worship God, what it looks like, what it sounds like, what it feels like, would you turn your back on all of it? 
that God asked you to? The answer for most of us is no. We wouldn't do it. We are too entrenched in a traditional way, in a cultural way, in a religious way, in the way that we do things. We wouldn't turn our back on that. Not even if Jesus was standing right in front of us and asking us to do so. But in this story, the answer for the woman is not no. It's not even maybe. It's yes. And not only did she say yes, she said yes and went to the top of the mountaintop and screamed it for everyone else to hear. He is the one. And even in the face of this murky water, when she didn't know what was on the other side, what was lingering beneath the surface, even upon turning her back on the, on the worship that she knew and understood, she chose to dive. The truth of the matter is, friends, the kingdom of God is never going to look the way that we think it ought to. It's never going to mimic our preferences. It's never going to mimic the world. And why? Why is that? Because the kingdom of God reflects the image of God, not the image of us. We spend so much of our time casting our own idea of what God is on God. God looks like this. God sounds like this. And that image is based on our limited perspective of the world, our limited experience in this place. But our experience is this vast, and God is this vast. There is so much more happening in the kingdom of God, and God can never be confined to our tiny scope of understanding. My friends, we don't transform God. God transforms us. And there's a beauty and a tranquility that's swimming just beneath the surface. But in order to encounter that peace that dwells in the presence of God, we must first be willing to dive, even when it's hard, even when we don't know what's beneath the surface, to surrender to the will of God in our lives and trust that God is working, to turn away from our desire to control the outcome, to turn away from I want to know what's next. For our faith to work in the way that God wants it to, we have to surrender. Beneath the surface, God is making a way. He's making a way inside of each and every one of us. Molding us and shaping us into the person that we're called to be in this life. And that development happens with or without us. It's happening here regardless of what we choose in this world. That change is ordained by God. So what are you willing to do to encounter that new version of yourself? Are you willing to dive in? Even when you don't know the outcome. Even when you're not sure what's waiting for you on the other side. Are you still willing to commit? God has shepherded and shaped us to do the hard work to die head first into a faith with reckless abandon. And in the midst of our surrender to the call of God in our lives, we encounter the hope that dwells within. So the only question before us today, so are you brave enough to dive so that you might be informed with that? Many of the Samaritans from that village committed themselves to him. Because of this woman's witness. He knew all of the things I did. He knows me. Inside and out. And they asked him to stay on. So Jesus stayed two days. A lot more people entrusted their lives to him. When they heard what he had to say. They said to the woman. We're no longer taking this on your say so. We've heard it for ourselves. And know it. For sure, he's the savior of the world. Thanks be to God.